I've known my wife for six years, and we have been married for five years. Currently, my wife is expecting a child and has decided to temporarily leave the police service. Unfortunately, an unpleasant incident recently occurred when an unscrupulous police officer appeared on the threshold of my house and began to threaten me. This happened on the basis of a quarrel that arose between me and my wife after she attacked me. I made the difficult decision to ask her to leave our house after a physical altercation that she initiated. He believed that having a badge gave him the right to do as he pleased. This policeman is my wife's partner in her patrol car during her active service. They have been working together for a little over a year. My wife has been a police officer for four years. Since she started serving with this man about a year ago, her behavior has become peculiar, as a result of which our marriage has suffered. Our differences turned into a serious quarrel after a heated argument during which she showed aggression by applying physical force to me. In this regard, I decided to ask her to leave our house. She called and demanded that he deal with me sternly, warned me that if I continued to provoke my wife, I would be put in jail. Deep down, I've always suspected their relationship, and now I have indisputable proof. Let me tell you about the circumstances that led to this disturbing meeting. It all started with the fact that after graduating from college with a degree in criminal justice, my wife thought about a career in law enforcement. At the same time, I was unemployed, and our financial situation was burdening us. The lucrative salary offered by the police department proved tempting in our desperate situation. Joining the police was easy for her, but she never considered this profession as a long-term one because of the dangers associated with working in the police. But the decisive moment was when she responded to the call about the attack on the family. While trying to detain the criminal, she tragically became the victim of a brutal attack, as a result of which she received a severe injury that bedred in her and almost deprived her of an eye. This tragic event occurred during her reaction to a quarrel between a woman and her boyfriend, who was under the influence of prohibited substances. Arriving at the scene, she expected that the consequences would be insignificant due to the lack of a partner and lack of staff. She believed that she could handle the situation alone, expecting that everything would work out without much effort. She knocked on the door but received no answer. But when she heard disturbing female screams coming from the house, she immediately called for backup and tried to enter the house. It took a few minutes, but eventually, she managed to get inside. Once inside, she was confronted by a man under the influence of drugs and brutally killing his wife. Quickly reacting, she took out a taser and tried to subdue the man with a stun gun, but this only inflamed his anger. As a result, he rushed at her before she could get a firearm, and a fight ensued in which she was seriously injured. Despite this, she showed amazing resilience, managing to hold the weapon until reinforcements arrived and quickly neutralized the attacker. This difficult incident caused her a feeling of horror akin to any other encounter with death because she could easily lose her life. Visiting her in the hospital was a very difficult ordeal, reminiscent of the consequences of a serious car accident. Her body looked swollen and bruised, leaving an indelible mark on one of the darkest days of my life. The doctor informed us that she was dangerously close to losing one of her eyes. This news was a wake-up call for both of us. I stayed by her side in the hospital for two days, watching her struggle not only with physical but also with mental injuries. Subsequently, she was granted paid leave for almost a month to help in the recovery process. During the entire period of her recovery, we had a deep conversation about her professional future. We have considered the possibility of her moving from her current job in law enforcement to the position of a TSA agent. Although the salary would not be so significant, the confidence in her safety would give me peace of mind every time she goes to work. There is a chance that this is her last day. Meanwhile, I was already nearing the end of my training as a mechanic and began to earn extra money repairing other people's cars, which covered our living expenses. As soon as my wife recovered, she returned to work, although she was assigned to a desk job to regain her self-confidence before going back to field duty. I remember how in the first week of work she came home upset, hungry for thrills and adventures. I recalled the incident when she rushed into battle without waiting for reinforcements and reminded her of the consequences. I assured her that she would get used to it over time. When my wife comes home, she always discusses her work in great detail and talks about her colleagues. I listen patiently, realizing that she needs to speak out. I prefer it to be me because I can't afford a therapist. 
About six months after switching jobs, she started mentioning a guy who had recently retired from the Marine Corps before joining the police force. He began to show excessive self-confidence, almost like a character from G.I. Joe. His behavior and attitude aroused her strong dislike, constantly expressing her contempt. She couldn't help but fixate on his arrogance, blatant disrespect, and deep-rooted hatred for him. My wife sincerely wanted him to answer for his actions and even hoped that trouble would come his way. She had heard rumors about his ill treatment of those arrested, and she believed that he was abusing his powers. In response, I suggested that she become an informant and expose his illegal actions, assuring her that she would be protected from any retaliation. Alternatively, she may prefer to turn a blind eye to the current situation. This was solely my point of view on this issue. I took her reaction as excessive, judging by her words. It occurred to me that she might envy him. My wife has always treated people who show excessive arrogance with contempt. I remember how passionately she disliked such people. After continuously venting her frustration for several months, it seemed that these thoughts had finally left her mind. I was comforted by the fact that she was no longer fixated on him. But my relief was short-lived as soon as she began to discuss the idea of returning to field duty. I made it clear that I strongly disagreed and stressed that this was an unreasonable decision. For some time, she respected my opinion and refrained from mentioning it. But then she repeatedly brought up this topic, assuring me that it was only about light work. I reminded her of the time when, due to light duty, she was first admitted to the hospital. Assuming that this would be the end of the conversation, I was surprised when she later mentioned that she was working extra shifts. Although I appreciated her willingness to contribute more, it seemed strange to me considering that at that moment, we did not feel an urgent need for money. Our financial situation was stable, and we lived together since she had previously stated her unwillingness to have children. Although I want to have children in the future, I was in no hurry to start a family. I had a suspicion that she had resumed patrolling without informing me, so I made an attempt to catch her at the scene of the crime. When I found out that she claims to work overtime, I decided to pay a visit to the police station where she is listed. But it was not easy to get into the office without warning her, so I patiently waited for her arrival. To my disappointment, she didn't show up for lunch or even for the end of the shift. Eventually, my patience ran out, and I reluctantly returned home. Later, when she returned from work, I told her about my suspicions. To my horror, she denied her guilt and claimed that she had been in her office the whole time. She knew that access to her office would be closed, and therefore I could not make sure that she was on patrol. Therefore, the only way out for me was to wait patiently and catch her in the act. To make the task easier for myself, I took another step forward and purchased a radio scanner. After watching enough movies, I decided to buy a police radio scanner. For two days, I diligently listened to the scanner and managed to record her conversations. But what surprised me most was that the person she was criticizing turned out to be her new partner in the patrol car. I never suspected that there was any romantic relationship between them. I was concerned primarily about her dishonesty and the potential danger that could lead to an attack and hospitalization. Now it seems she intends to imitate the adventurous spirit of her favorite heroine of the police TV show, like a real soldier Jane. But in my opinion, she looks too gentle and cute to work in the patrol. This role is not suitable for everyone, and I wonder how she was allowed to perform it at all. When she returned home that evening, I asked her about collaborating with someone I consider her opponent. She justified her actions by saying that she had no alternative and he was the only option for a patrol partner. She insisted that she had no say in the matter. Moreover, she tried to convince me that I should be grateful that she has a courageous and selfless colleague who puts his life on the line. Supposedly, he ensures her safety. I protested to her that she wouldn't need any protection if she stayed at her job or left the police altogether. But she ignored my concerns. When she began to share her new admiration for the police, expressing her passion and desire to become a detective and move up the corporate ladder, it became obvious that someone was influencing her thoughts. It seemed that her partner in the patrol car was feeding her lines, gradually turning her into his reflection. Despite the noticeable changes in her behavior, I preferred not to pay attention to it, trusting my wife. But over time, the changes became more and more noticeable, and I was faced with a completely unfamiliar version of my wife. 
she no longer communicated with me the way she used to. Her availability became unpredictable. We used to plan to spend time together, and now she doesn't want to do it. She often mentioned that she had to accompany her partner on patrol because he wanted to work extra hours. Now my plans depend on when her partner decides to work overtime. She, without hesitation, abruptly changed our plans to join this intensive patrol. I explained to her that this is not a military platoon, and they are not at war. You can't just cancel plans with your husband to give preference to your work partner. Regardless of the fact that he works in the police, there are other qualified specialists who can fulfill his role. However, her answer that she did not want to disappoint him deeply angered me. It was at this point that I began to doubt whether she was having an extramarital affair. After expressing my suspicions to her, I stressed that she should stop working with him due to the fact that, in my opinion, they are having an affair. In response, she called me an insecure person and stressed that he was already married and had children. That's what she told me. In response, his complete fidelity to his wife speaks volumes, revealing everything I needed to understand. It became obvious that he himself had the right to decide with whom he should enter into intimate relations, since his wife's statement that he would never be unfaithful implied that she was making signs of attention to him. When I expressed my concerns, she brushed them off, saying that women at his job often flirt with him but he remains loyal. Moreover, he constantly demonstrates his support by putting likes on all her photos on Facebook. This behavior raises questions. Who is trying so hard to evaluate photos of a married woman? I expressed to her my concerns about the current situation, to which she replied that he was just her work partner. From that moment on, our marriage began to experience significant difficulties. I became more and more offended with my wife for refusing to stop cooperating with this man, seemingly oblivious to the fact that I felt uncomfortable. And when I expressed my displeasure to her, she assured me that she had put an end to their partnership. But when I asked for confirmation from her colleagues, they confirmed that he was still her patrol partner. Eventually, she started talking about how she would like to take a break from working in the police. She expressed her desire to start a family, mentioning her intention to stop taking contraceptives. I didn't take it as a suspicion, perhaps because her partner in the service already had children, and she wanted to share this experience. Besides, I also had a desire to have children. About a month later, she became pregnant. About three months after that, I decided to accept a highly profitable position as a maintenance technician in a reputable company. The financial benefits outweighed those of working as a mechanic, which made it simply incredible. As a result, I started commuting to work three days a week. During this period, my wife was about three to four months pregnant and decided to take a vacation. In this regard, I became the sole breadwinner in our house. It seemed a little strange to me that she stayed at home all day and didn't do much, but I didn't think about it. After returning from a conservative three-day trip, a neighbor with whom I became friends due to the fact that, at one time, I repaired his car for free, told me that a police officer came to my house three days in a row and spent several hours each time. It is important to note that my wife did not work during this period. There didn't seem to be any good reason for a police officer to visit our house. On my return, I talked to my wife about this. At first, she denied that she knew about such visits, but when I mentioned that someone was watching the house, her opinion quickly changed. She stated that she was lonely while I was not at home and she was just looking for companionship, insisting that these visits were innocent. I noted that she could have turned to her friends to find company rather than involve a policeman. I questioned her choice and expressed my concerns, which she rejected, considering that I was overreacting. The disagreements escalated, and I confessed to her that I no longer trusted her and suspected her of having an affair. This revelation caused her emotional reaction and loss of self-control. She started accusing me of being insecure, to which I replied that if she hadn't behaved inappropriately, then I wouldn't feel insecure. In the midst of our heated argument, she unexpectedly hit me twice in the face. Concerned for my safety, I instinctively grabbed her hand to prevent further aggression. It is important to note that at the time of this incident, she was five months pregnant. So, I tried to behave with extreme caution and restraint. Unfortunately, the fact that she resorted to physical violence did not come as a surprise to me since she had previously demonstrated similar behavior when she felt guilty and lost control of her emotions. I calmly and firmly guided her to the exit, 
gently holding her hands while she resisted and tried to free herself. Throughout this ordeal, she shouted humiliating remarks and insults at me, making noise that I knew our neighbors must have heard. It became clear to me that I couldn't let her stay in the house that night. I carefully sat her down at the entrance and quickly locked the door, ensuring her safety from the outside. She made futile attempts to break down the door, but her attempts were unsuccessful. Apparently, she turned to our neighbor for help and took his phone. Surprisingly, she did not call 911 or seek help from family and friends. Instead, she decided to call her patrolman partner. To my great surprise, he appeared on the doorstep accompanied by his partner, both armed and asserting their police authority. They immediately started accusing me of various offenses without having any evidence or understanding of the situation. Fortunately, I was smart enough to document the visible bruises she received during the quarrel. I quickly took photos to prove that she was the aggressor. As the patrolman seemed ready to resort to extreme measures against me, it seemed that he was trying to throw me off balance for unknown reasons. As a result, it turned out that the reason for the patrolman's intervention could be an illegal relationship with my wife. She has already fabricated a story, falsely claiming that I was the initiator of the quarrel and mocked her, despite the absence of any evidence in favor of her claims. However, I had visible bruises, which served as proof of her aggression. Despite this, I was unfairly handcuffed and treated like a criminal within the confines of my own home. In the end, I was ordered to temporarily leave my home, at least for the night. I tried to find shelter with my neighbors, trying to realize the unfairness of the situation and considering the necessary steps to file a lawsuit. It was shocking that the patrolman even falsified a report on a domestic incident. The next morning, I returned to my house, determined to deal with the unfair treatment I had been subjected to. My wife finally admitted her actions and expressed remorse for hitting me and falsely accusing me of starting a quarrel. Despite her belated apologies, I have firmly decided that it is in our best interests to separate, at least until she gives birth to our child. When I informed her of my decision to leave, she expressed concern about financial support during her absence from work. I suggested that she seek help from the person she had called the day before, hinting at her involvement with him. The next day, I moved out of our shared accommodation, assuring her that I would pay half the rent. I may be trying to deny the truth, but I can't continue living in a place where I know she's involved with another man. Despite the fact that my name is indicated in the lease agreement, I have decided to leave this place. The undeniable reality remains, despite all the false fabrications that she can create. After two days of separation from my wife, she began to persistently persuade me to return home. But I explained to her that I was currently on a business trip and that we should live separately until the birth of the child. I intended to pick up my things after the end of my current business trip. Despite the circumstances, I continued to answer her phone calls and maintain a polite conversation. During one of our conversations, I plucked up the courage and touched on the topic of her novel, but she stubbornly denied her involvement in it and disavowed this topic in every possible way. She expressed bewilderment about my decision to break up with her, categorically denying the fact of infidelity on her part. Unfortunately, I had no concrete evidence to confirm my suspicions. To my chagrin, she began to turn our relatives and friends against me. She actively presented her arguments to my parents, falsely accusing me of abandoning her and spreading lies about her. As a result, my parents, guided by the desire to take on the role of grandparents, completely sided with her. Despite this, I felt obliged to share my suspicions with them, hoping that they would understand my point of view. Moreover, she went so far as to attract her lover to forcibly evict me from our own home, which was ignored and rejected by my parents. She managed to manipulate both of them using lies to gain their support. To top it all off, I received a threatening phone call from her father, with whom I have never had a good relationship. Unable to stand his presence, I quickly interrupted the conversation because our dislike for each other was mutual. Apparently, the apple doesn't fall far from the apple tree. Everything was complicated by the fact that we have three close friends in common, to whom she turned first of all, seeking comfort and shedding tears because of the current situation. Amid all this turmoil, I can't ignore the fact that she is pregnant. Her ability to evoke sympathy from others led to the fact that my fears about her infidelity were rejected. Everyone seemed to think I was making up stories because they couldn't imagine that she was capable of such actions. Disappointed by the unfair treatment of myself, 
I turned to a lawyer to find out what I should do with police officers in case of illegal detention and eviction from my own home, despite the fact that I was the victim of an attack. To top it all off, a false police report was filed against me. In the following weeks, our communication was reduced to heated telephone conversations, during which we tried to sort out a difficult situation. So far, we have not been able to find a solution and improve our relationship. Surprisingly, she managed to enlist the support of everyone, including my parents, as a result of which I felt isolated in my suspicions. Having no concrete evidence of her alleged infidelity, I began to doubt the validity of my doubts. But during our separation, my neighbor kindly looked after my wife when he was at home. To my surprise, he informed me that not a single police car came to us, and his wife rarely left the house, only for business and groceries. This discovery made me reconsider my accusations and wonder if I had wrongly accused her of infidelity. Uncertainty and internal conflict persisted for almost a month after we broke up. My wife was already six months pregnant. In the end, we managed to reconcile, and I decided to move in with her again. Surprisingly, it seemed to me that nothing had happened, as if we had returned to the old life. She did everything possible so that I wouldn't suspect anything, behaved the same as before. But due to my busy work schedule, I was often not at home, and I could not count on the supervision of a neighbor since he had his own job. Deciding to get to the truth, I took matters into my own hands and installed several hidden cameras throughout the house. I placed them in the bedroom, living room, and even in the driveway, hoping to catch at least some clues that could confirm my suspicions. During this month, my business trips were more frequent than ever before. There were times when I was absent for a whole week, deliberately giving her the opportunity to commit treason. The hidden camera remained unnoticed for almost a month, and I diligently scanned the recordings, hoping to detect any signs of her connection with a work partner or suspicious behavior. But to my surprise, Nothing remarkable could be found, as if everything was in perfect order, and there was no reason to worry. Frustrated by the lack of evidence, I eventually resigned myself. Although my suspicions persisted, without concrete evidence and her refusal to admit anything, I had no serious reason to continue the investigation. We moved forward when she was about seven and a half months pregnant. Over time, it would seem that we have moved away from the difficulties of our difficult past due to the upcoming birth of a child. I made a conscious decision to limit my trips to local regions, which allowed me to spend more time with my wife. As the due date approached, I found myself with her more and more often. I cherished these moments of life together. But during this period, I could not help but notice that she was constantly engaged in correspondence on the phone. At first, I thought they were friends or relatives and did not attach any importance to this. However, as this happened more and more often, it began to bother me because it seemed that she was interfering with our time together. The constant flow of text messages began to overshadow the moments of our communication, and I felt more and more anxious. I couldn't help but be suspicious when I noticed her unusual behavior while answering the call, the way she was smiling and giggling, trying to hide it as if she didn't want me to notice, made me uneasy. Given her current condition, almost eight months pregnant, I did not expect her to be unfaithful. One evening, when we were enthusiastically watching TV, an SMS notification suddenly came to her phone. Without thinking, she quickly grabbed it and disappeared into the bathroom. The transparency of her actions left no room for doubt, she was obviously hiding something. Curiosity got the better of me, and I instinctively turned down the volume of the TV and cautiously approached the bathroom door, trying to eavesdrop on her conversation. My suspicions were heightened when I saw that she was engaged in correspondence. It was at this moment that an uneasy feeling settled in my gut, indicating that something was wrong. Everything was complicated by the fact that she had an iPhone that required fingerprint verification, and we didn't know each other's passwords. Determined to get to the truth, I waited patiently for her to fall asleep. When she did, I took the opportunity to secretly use her fingerprint to unlock the phone. Silently on tiptoe, I went to the bathroom, wanting to get acquainted with the contents of her messages. To my surprise, the last conversation she had was with someone named Sophie. The peculiarity of this exchange was that there was only one message left from Sophie, an innocent wish for sweet dreams. It would seem that it's okay, right? However, my suspicions flare up again when I thought about the perplexing scenario. 
How could it happen that she was texting in the bathroom for almost half an hour, and only one message from Sophie was visible, sweet dreams? Moreover, the previous message from an unknown subscriber was received almost three hours ago. It became obvious that Sophie was the only recipient of her recent messages. At that moment, my intuition sharpened again, causing a feeling of anxiety. The only plausible explanation for this unusual situation was that she deliberately deleted the messages to hide the evidence. A wave of nausea swept over me, and I felt completely out of place. I was overcome by the thought that she might cheat again, or even worse, that she never stopped cheating but just hid it from me. I felt depressed. Deciding to gather more evidence, I discreetly wrote down Sophie's phone number and carefully sat down next to her on the bed. Overcome with anxiety that night, I couldn't sleep. I was restless and immersed in thoughts about the upcoming revelations. The next day, during my lunch break, I sought solace at the nearest payphone. Plucking up the courage, I dialed the right number, expecting it to be her partner. Assuming the guise of a utility worker, I insinuated his name, and to my horror, he confirmed his identity. At that moment, all the suspicions that I had harbored before returned, confirming my fears. Returning home in the evening, I felt a heavy load of uncertainty, fatigue consumed me, and I had no strength left to resist it. At this moment, everything was complicated by the fact that the date of birth was approaching. I devised a plan to abandon her after the baby was born, but every time I looked at her swelling belly, I was overcome with deep affection. At those moments, I longed to spend the rest of my life with her, united in an ideal family. A puzzled question was spinning in my head. Why couldn't she just be faithful? It seemed incomprehensible to me that she continued to date her patrol partner, constantly lying and causing me immeasurable suffering. The visible signs of my depression and anxiety could not be hidden, they cast a dark shadow on our relationship. I longed to meet her face to face, understand her motives, and ask her to stop this cycle of deception. Emotions weighed heavily on me, I was visibly depressed and overwhelmed by a sense of anxiety, juggling the emotions that overwhelmed us related to our relationship and the impending arrival of the child. After a while, she finally gave birth to our boy. The thought that the child might not be mine did not leave my head. In my opinion, the child was similar to me, although at such a young age, it was difficult to make sure of this. The truth remained a mystery, leaving room for speculation. It's been a few days since she was discharged from the hospital, and I've plucked up the courage to talk to her about suspicious messages. She hastily came up with a lie, claiming that the messages were from her friend. Doubts continued to nod my conscience, forcing me to tell that I made a fatal call to this number, but only her partner answered. But despite all kinds of evidence, she stubbornly denied her guilt. Disappointed by her persistent refusal, I demanded that she open the message and dialed the number on the speakerphone, to which she categorically refused. At that moment, I reached a breaking point, the burden of her lies became unbearable, and I declared that I was tired of her deception. Having decided to act, I announced my intention to move out of our common house once again. In desperation, she begged me for understanding and finally confessed the truth. She admitted that the messages were indeed from her former patrol partner, but she hid his name out of a false sense of gratitude. She didn't want to seem ungrateful by ignoring his attempts to keep in touch. Realizing that this might confuse me, she resorted to using an assumed name to hide the truth from me. Her confession hung in the air, leaving us both vulnerable and unsure of what lies ahead. I told her my decision to resign from the position of a police officer and look for another job, and she readily agreed to do it. In addition, she agreed to block his number and stop all communication with him. I witnessed how, in my presence, she immediately took action by blocking his number. Although I understand that in the future she may unlock it and continue their romance unnoticed, it is obvious that she is making an effort not to let me leave. Our situation developed smoothly without any complications. We happily celebrated the birth of a child with our family. Moreover, we were actively looking for a place to buy, demonstrating our desire to build a future together. Since we lived in a rented house, I began to increase the number of work-related business trips in order to save up for the down payment for my own housing. The maintenance of a newborn child and an unemployed wife may require a lot of financial expenses, but I accepted the joy of becoming a father. She expressed a desire to take a one-year break from work to devote herself to caring for our child, and I sincerely agreed. 
I thought it would be more useful for our child if during this crucial period he would be under the close attention of his mother and not rely on a kindergarten or a nanny, at least until the baby grows up a little. A few months passed, and I went on a business trip. I became more and more convinced that there were cases when I tried to contact her by phone but received neither a response nor any form of communication. Even in the evenings when she was supposed to be at home, she didn't answer my calls. Given her jobless status and her primary responsibility for caring for our child, it seemed strange to me that she wasn't picking up the phone. In search of some clarity, I decided to consult with a neighbor who found out that my wife spends a lot of time outside the house when I'm away. This information made me think that she might be doing questionable things again, and I knew that she would not admit to anything unless she was caught red-handed. Based on this, I returned home that week ready to face the situation head-on. Trying to find out the whereabouts of my wife and the reasons for her prolonged absence, I decided to purchase and install a GPS tracking device in her car. I wanted to understand where she takes our child while not at home and also to find out the reasons for her long absence. In order to provide myself with the necessary time for observation, I talked to my boss and asked for business trips until the end of the month. This way, I would be able to closely monitor the GPS data. In addition, I informed my wife that I would be traveling out of state, which gave me the opportunity to discreetly monitor her movements when I was not at home. As expected, on the same day, I pretended that I was going on a trip out of state. In the evening, events unfolded according to plan. She drove up to an unfamiliar apartment complex, and when I arrived there, I realized that it was closed, and I would not be able to enter it until someone opened the gate. Eventually, I managed to gain access and park my car a few places away from hers. By the time I arrived, she had already gotten out of the car and entered one of the apartments of the apartment building. Unfortunately, I was unable to see her enter a specific apartment, and I was unable to pinpoint her exact location. Deciding to test her honesty, I devised a plan to call and find out about her whereabouts. But when I tried to call her while she was in the apartment, she didn't answer my call. After about 30 minutes, she called me back. Being interested in the delay in answering, I asked why she didn't answer my calls for so long. She quickly explained that she was busy taking care of our child, but during the conversation, I noticed significant background noise which made me doubt that she was really at home. It was a deliberate attempt to test her honesty. In response, she stated that she was really at home. Taking advantage of the moment, I informed her that my intended trip was cancelled, and I would be back home in less than 30 minutes. She was stunned into silence, trying to find the right words. Sensing her concern, I demanded an explanation, to which she replied that everything was fine. In response, she quickly explained that my early return took her by surprise and now she needs to prepare and clean the house in a hurry. Puzzled by her answer, I asked what exactly she needed to cook, but instead of a clear answer, she continued to stumble in the middle of a word, even more incriminating herself. It became clear to me that she had been caught in a lie. She abruptly interrupted the conversation, promising to call back in a few minutes because of the crying baby. About ten minutes later, I saw her running out of the apartment clutching a baby swing in one hand and a bag with a baby in the other. And guess who appeared behind her in the image of her father? When she opened the trunk of the SUV, her former partner was next to her. It was obvious that they were still in touch since she hadn't bothered to block his number. Strangely, he held the baby in his arms as if it were his own. This man, who already had his own family and three children, lived with them in a suburban house, but it seemed that they rented an apartment just to meet each other. However, my intuition told me that something was wrong. The way he treated the child made me doubt his paternity. Overwhelmed by the situation, I could no longer contain my emotions. I quickly got out of the car and collided with them head-on. Shock was reflected on their faces, they were taken by surprise by my presence. Without hesitation, I made it clear to her that it was not worth returning home since I had caught her in the act, and the consequences would depend on her. She was silent, did not ask for apologies, and did not give explanations. Hurriedly getting into the car, she realized that their secret was revealed in a hurry. They drove out of the parking lot, overcome with anger and betrayal. I quickly got into my car and dialed her father's number. I told him frankly about the events that had taken place and told the truth directly. I expressed to her father my deep concern about his daughter's actions as they coincided with my previous statements. 
I firmly stated my intention to take a paternity test because I had doubts about my biological connection with the child. I explained that the child belongs to a man who already has a family, three children, and a marriage. I must admit that emotions have taken over, but I defend my actions without any remorse. This woman has been playing with me, deceiving me, and manipulating me for a long time. By exposing her true identity, I actually drove her out of her secret hiding place, just like they drive out rats. If she really had no desire to be with me, why didn't she just leave me alone? Throughout the entire period of our separation, I never stopped wondering why she resorted to manipulations, not only with me but also with others, in order to restore our relationship. Upon returning home, as expected, she was nowhere to be found. The next day, with tears in her eyes, she called me and said that she had not committed any wrongdoing and she really needed to return home for the sake of our child. She explained that the necessary things for the baby, milk bottles, clothes, were left in the house, which does not give rest to either her or the crying baby. In response, I told her that she could return home and at the same time expressed my own decision to leave. I made a firm decision to terminate our marriage once and for all because I strongly doubt that the child is biologically mine. She objected, insisting that the child was really mine and warned me about the possible remorse I would feel if I gave up my flesh and blood to dispel my doubts. I strongly demanded a paternity test, stressing that her constant contacts with a former colleague on patrol were obvious and that she could not deny their connection. In the end, she returned home accompanied by one of her friends, probably fearing that I might behave inappropriately. It was obvious that she understood the gravity of the situation. Realizing that the situation could escalate, she decided to take her friends with her. Sensing the importance of the moment, I immediately ordered a DNA analysis kit over the internet and arranged for its expedited delivery that day. I made a conscious decision to refrain from communication, offering her silence despite her insistent requests to join the conversation. I refrained, fearing that emotions would take over. I became deeply attached to the child, providing for all his needs and needs. Knowing myself well, I understood that an attempt to enter into a dialogue would only lead to tears flowing down my face. The idea that the child might not be biologically mine was incredibly difficult for me, but after the DNA analysis kit was obtained, it was not easy to find an opportunity to take a smear from the child since she was constantly in the presence of a friend. In the end, her friend left, realizing that I posed no threat. It wasn't until the third day that we finally started talking. I entered into the dialogue solely to convince her to give me the opportunity to support the child even for the last time. My love for children and the desire to become a father were the driving forces of my desire to communicate with the child. During this period, I did not lose hope that the child was biologically mine, and I was looking forward to the paternity test confirming this. Taking advantage of the opportunity, I quietly collected a sample for analysis and sent it without my wife's knowledge. When the results came, I was in another area of the city for work. With a heavy heart, I looked through the results on the internet and to my great chagrin discovered that the child is not my biological one. Overcome with emotion, I shared the results with my parents, irrationally accusing them of doubting me, although I was not going to tell them about it as I sincerely wanted my doubts to be false. I also felt it necessary to report the results to her father, seeking his support and understanding which I needed so much during this difficult time. My wife was the last one to get the test results, and she didn't get them from me. Considering everything she put me through, it seems likely that she knew the baby wasn't mine. Since we have no common property, our divorce should not be a lengthy process according to the requirements of the legislation. I am recognized as the legitimate father of the child since at the time of the child's birth, I was married to his mother and signed the birth certificate. For the termination of the relationship between parents and children, the termination of alimony obligations, and ultimately the termination of the marriage, I need to go to court. I turned to a lawyer with the intention of speeding up the process of handing my wife the divorce papers. A significant amount of time has passed since then, 14 months to be precise, and a lot of things have happened. Due to constant harassment by the local police, I decided to move from the city where I spent my childhood. Despite filing complaints and successfully winning one court case, the harassment continued, and I came to the conclusion that moving out of town is the best way out, especially considering my frequent business trips. I wanted to move to the countryside as it suits my interests related to hunting and camping. Given my frequent business trips, 
I spend a significant part of my time away from home, therefore, the specific place of residence does not matter much to me. In addition, I have acquired nine acres of land which allows me to have personal space for hunting and camping in my free time when I am traveling around the country. The events that unfolded after my wife was handed the divorce papers in her house, and I was out of town, led to complete chaos. Despite her persistent calls, I decided not to answer them. Two days after handing over the documents, I returned home with a U-Haul car to pick up my things and prepare for the move. Upon arrival, she tried to prevent my movement, but I guaranteed that I would take only those things that rightfully belonged to me. I left all our common possessions as it was clear that our marriage had come to an end. The truth about the character and actions of my ex-wife has now become known to everyone thanks to the published results of establishing paternity. She can no longer manipulate others as they have witnessed the truth. Before leaving, after packing my things, I asked my ex-wife for the last opportunity to support the child, and to my surprise, she agreed. Holding the child in my arms, I could not help but wish that he was my biological father since my love for him remained unchanged. Seeing me with the child, my ex-wife burst into tears and expressed remorse for everything she had done. At that moment, I quickly returned the child to my ex-wife as I felt emotions bubbling inside me. I didn't want her to see my tears. I have purchased a large plot of land on which there is a small lake. This new ownership gives me the opportunity to go hunting and camping when I'm not busy with my travel schedule. I find great satisfaction in this nomadic lifestyle, which allows me to explore different corners of the country. I sought solace in the tranquility of a place that I now consider my own. It still upsets me that the consequences of this situation primarily fall on me, my ex-wife, and an innocent child, while her partner in an affair seems to avoid any real consequences. Although I cannot unequivocally state that he is the biological father of the child, various circumstances strongly indicate his involvement, their long professional cooperation, which lasted more than a year, their almost two-year relationship, as well as the neighbor's story that he came to my house presumably for an illegal relationship with my wife. All this contributes to the disclosure of the truth about this man. He rented an apartment to facilitate a date with my wife. Having decided to reveal the truth, I diligently collected evidence, including the results of the paternity examination, in order to expose him. I intended to contact his wife and share this important information with her. By subscribing to a paid service, I successfully found out his place of residence and the identity of his wife. After finding their house in the suburbs and making sure that he left for work in the presence of his wife, I took the opportunity to deliver a package with evidence. But one fateful evening, when I was returning from a friend's house, my path was suddenly interrupted when I was stopped by the police. Wondering why I was stopped because I was not speeding and did not commit any obvious violations, at first, I assumed that it could be my ex-wife's partner in love affairs. But it turned out that it was an unfamiliar person. It's been many years since I last encountered a similar situation, so the randomness of the stop caught me off guard. The officer stated that I had exceeded the speed limit by 10 miles per hour, which I categorically disagreed with. Despite my objections, he issued me a fine, ordering me to appear in court. If you are familiar with the intricacies of the judicial system, then you understand what problems and difficulties can await me if you find out that challenging a fine will cost you more. So I'd rather take a fine and drive to remove it from my track record than waste time on litigation, time that could be spent on important things. I thought of it as a slight inconvenience. Less than a week after receiving the fine, I received a speeding ticket again. I knew I wasn't speeding. I knew what was going on, a police pursuit. I was being chased. This time I lost my temper because the policeman was deliberately mocking me. At first, he asked me for my license and registration, and then began to ask meaningless questions, including whether I had a court order. Despite the fact that he had already examined my documents and found no evidence, he continued to inquire if I had stolen a car. Expressing my disappointment, I frankly told him that his question was completely stupid. In response, he became furious and demanded that I get out of the car. Asserting my innocence, I refused and suggested that he contact his superiors to sort out the situation. After that, he called for the help of law enforcement officers who forcibly pulled me out of the car and handcuffed me. The actions of law enforcement officers were excessively aggressive. As a result of excessive use of force by police officers, I received lacerations on my hands, bruised ribs, and constant back pain. 
Due to the severity of the situation, I was placed in jail overnight, and my parents had to pay bail for my release. Realizing the true nature of what happened, they supported my decision to file a complaint against the actions of the officers who carried out the detention. A man who had an affair with my ex-wife deftly withdrew from direct participation in the incident and entrusted the implementation of his evil intentions to others. My parents, fearing for my safety, felt that it was too risky to stay in this city and suggested that I move to the countryside. As a result, I made a firm decision to move to the countryside in search of peace and an opportunity to start life with a clean slate, away from painful circumstances. Because of the targeted harassment by the local police, I am in constant fear. It was only by lucky chance that they did not plan any incriminating objects in my car, since such an act could lead to false imprisonment, which would jeopardize my work and personal freedom. Therefore, I refuse to risk my livelihood for the sake of a man who aspires to be nothing more than a self-appointed law enforcement officer. Taking matters into my own hands, I filed a lawsuit against my wife's lover for filing a false statement to the police. As a result, a lawsuit was filed against two officers responsible for my illegal arrest and subsequent false imprisonment. Since this is a civil case, I intend to achieve justice and bring those responsible to justice for their actions. The responsibility for substantiating my claims against my ex-wife's partner lies with me, since they must be proven, taking into account the principle of the balance of probabilities. Fortunately, I have evidence that the officer who made the arrest in my case of domestic violence was previously associated with my wife for work. In addition, I can provide evidence that I was the victim of an attack, which refutes any claims to the contrary. Furthermore, documents confirm that my wife did not contact the rescue service via a specially designated 911 line, but contacted the officer directly by his personal mobile phone number. Additionally, I have convincing evidence that my wife has had an extramarital affair. All these proofs together confirm my correctness and shed light on the true state of things. Against the background of the undoubted connection between the officer and my ex-wife, I successfully presented evidence confirming that this child is not my biological relative. This discovery played an important role in achieving a favorable settlement of the case, as a result of which the decision was made in favor of my ex-wife's partner in an affair. Despite the fact that the case of false imprisonment was dismissed, I still intend to seek justice and have decided to resume the trial in the judicial system. In addition, I took the initiative to file an application against my ex-wife's lover at the police station, pointing out his deceptive actions and manipulative behavior. What pleases me is that I received information that disciplinary measures were applied to him as a result of the consideration of the complaint. Although the specific actions remain unclear, although I admit the possibility of corruption in the police department, I find comfort in the fact that this incident will be recorded in his personal file. From the latest updated data, I learned that my ex-wife's partner has already separated from his spouse. I provided his wife with the evidence necessary to finally break off the relationship with him and thereby explained his current revenge on me using the force of the law. Since then, I have not communicated with my ex-wife directly, but through mutual acquaintances, I learned that she resumed work in the police. It's amazing that my ex-wife is now cohabiting with her lover in the very apartment where I caught them red-handed. After leaving the city, I plunged headlong into the world of online dating, usually arranging meetings in advance when I planned to visit a new place. I was fortunate enough to communicate with different women in every city I visited, and some of these meetings even showed the potential for long-term relationships. But the idea of remarriage does not leave my mind because I still feel the burden of those years that, in my opinion, were wasted in my previous marriage. Therefore, I still do not dare to remarry. I continued to sue my ex-wife's lover in court. I applied all the evidence of his official violations as well as the reasons for his actions towards me. For more months passed, and the court was on my side. My ex-wife and her lover were fired from their jobs in disgrace, and he was also required to undergo a DNA paternity test. As I was sure he is the biological father of my child, my heart felt lighter when I finally proved my truth. I was sent on a business trip to another state for three months, and all this time I didn't know how my ex-wife and her lover lived. But when I returned from the business trip, I found out the terrible truth. As our mutual friend told me, after the dismissal of my ex-wife and her lover from work, he began to drink alcohol excessively out of desperation at the loss of his beloved job and income. This led to the fact that one evening when he returned home, he severely beat my ex-wife, also breaking her two ribs. Once in this state, 
she was in the clinic for a month, and the beatings did not fully recover. After severe injuries, she could not move normally, as a friend who met her on the street told me. My ex-wife walked like an old grandmother, apparently, not only her ribs were damaged, but also her spine. It was clear that she remained disabled for the rest of her life. She did not spare her lover and the father of the child and wrote a statement against him. After that, he was sentenced to five years in prison. I was shocked by this news, and I even felt sorry for my ex-wife, and most of all, I was worried about the child who turned out to be not mine, which I am still experiencing with a heavy heart. I firmly believe that the most ideal partner you can hope for is someone who not only sincerely believes in his dreams but also remains a constant source of support during life's ups and downs. If your partner enjoys your company during the good times but abandons you or loses faith in you when you face difficulties, it is in your best interest to free yourself from such a relationship. Story 2 The passing of my ex-girlfriend Beverly destroyed my world, or so I thought at the time. I was very close to giving up on my dream, but looking back, I'm grateful I didn't. I hope that my story will help you draw some valuable conclusions. My name is Jaden, and at the age of 27, I started a relationship with my ex-girlfriend Beverly, who was 25 at the time. Our romantic journey began when we met at a mutual friend's birthday celebration. An undeniable bond immediately arose between us, seemingly beyond the control of time. The party dragged on late, and throughout the night, Beverly gave me all her attention. For some inexplicable reason, I had the feeling that she decided to spend time with me that night and not with other guys. Perhaps because she considered me another privileged rich kid like everyone else, but anyway, Beverly was wrong. Despite the fact that I was surrounded by rich peers, I was not one of them. When I entered the club, my gaze immediately stopped at Beverly's captivating blue eyes. Tall with a fair complexion and blonde hair, she easily stood out among her friends, and it was impossible not to notice her presence. Dressed in a captivating short red dress with a daring double slit at hip level, her immaculately shaven legs attracted attention. The outfit was complemented by flawless makeup, and long blonde hair cascaded gracefully down her back. My gaze stopped on her, unable to distract myself. Sensing my captivity, she came up to me and introduced herself amiably. After we indulged in frivolous adult games, by the will of fate, Beverly and I found ourselves in the same company at an evening party. At the party, it was obvious to everyone that she radiated an undeniable aura, easily filling the room with energy and inspiration. From the moment I saw Beverly, I had a feeling of familiarity, but I could not identify its source. Soon, she came to my chair and warmly introduced herself. Taking the opportunity, I asked about our possible previous acquaintance to which she nonchalantly suggested that perhaps I had met her on television or in fashion magazines. At the mention of her, I remembered that I had seen her briefly on television and on billboards, showing the captivating outfits of a famous fashion brand. Beverly, once famous in the modeling business, went on the catwalks for the famous American clothing brand, the name of which was not disclosed. It was at this moment that everything fell into place, revealing the secret of her striking resemblance to her friend. Dressed in exquisite outfits, radiating elegance and slimness of the figure, they became obvious. Most of those with whom she communicated were none other than the models themselves. Beverly's modeling career went downhill after she made several unjustified Instagram posts about a designer brand she was associated with. These messages eventually led to the termination of the contract with Beverly, as a result of which she had to look for other opportunities to work as a model. Her story is very touching because she just started her way in the industry and did not expect such serious consequences for her mistakes on social networks. I was completely fascinated by her. It seemed to me that love overtook me the moment I saw her. Everything fascinated me, her vibrant energy, her infectious smile, the undeniable aura surrounding her, the way she spoke. Her every word had a certain charm that attracted me. Even her presence, the way she carried herself, exuded elegance and grace. She had refined taste, always preferring the best, expensive jewelry, exquisite clothes, luxurious shoes, stylish glasses. She perceived all this with genuine passion, and I have to admit that her fame gave her an additional attraction, a note of excitement that intrigued me even more. After that unforgettable night, Beverly and I began to spend time together more often, attracting the attention of many onlookers wherever we went. It made me think that she shared my feelings. 
To express my sympathy, I took her shopping, accompanied her to posh restaurants, and other places at her request. Although we hadn't officially started dating yet, I wanted to show my love for her and show that I would treat her like royalty if she agreed to be my girlfriend. I ended up owning a collection of boats and motorcycles that I inherited from my late father. Over the past six years, I have successfully managed this inheritance, and financial stability has never caused me any concerns. Moreover, I thrived on independence. During this time, I enjoyed spending time with Beverly, and as our relationship strengthened, I plucked up the courage and asked her to become my girlfriend. To my delight, she agreed. After a few weeks, I decided and asked her to move in with me. Fortunately, I lived in the house bequeathed to me by my father, and we were both comfortable and calm. Beverly was free to invite friends and throw parties whenever she wanted. Our relationship flourished during the first three years, marked by wonderful moments. During this whole period, Beverly decided not to work, which didn't bother me since I was able to provide for both of us. When Beverly wanted something, I quickly fulfilled her wishes without hesitation. Often on my own initiative, I went into stores and bought things for her. Guided by my own desire, I tried to indulge my partner's love for designer things, willingly accompanying her on shopping trips in search of her favorite brands. If a new phone appeared on the market, I made sure to surprise her on the day of its release. Similarly, if a new collection of designer bags or glasses appeared, I would also willingly buy them for her. Our relationship flourished thanks to such gestures of care. Our adventures went beyond material indulgences. We enjoyed going to parties and clubs together, creating unforgettable memories. Our shared passion for travel led us to a wonderful vacation, fulfilling Beverly's dream of visiting different countries. We even took the initiative to get a scuba diving certificate, immersing ourselves in the beauty of the underwater world side by side. Meanwhile, Beverly has constantly stated her desire to create her own online clothing store specializing in selling used celebrity items at reasonable prices. Given her connections in the industry, I found her idea very promising and decided to wholeheartedly support her endeavor by investing a significant amount of money. Unfortunately, Beverly recklessly squandered all the funds on frivolous expenses, which eventually led to the abandonment of plans to launch an online store. I refrained from pressuring her about money because I was of the opinion that everyone makes mistakes, and I hoped that she would learn from her mistake. On the contrary, I dreamed of selling my logistics company and growing my finances. This dream of my whole life materialized when a profitable buyer showed interest in acquiring my company, which prompted me to sell it without hesitation. After the sale, I acquired a considerable fortune, which allowed me to purchase the necessary resources for my farm. At first, my mushroom growing business seemed promising, but then it quickly turned into chaos. During the first year, I faced numerous problems and setbacks. Despite the considerable funds invested in the farm, it did not bring any positive results. In this regard, I was forced to reconsider my spending habits and give up traveling and fine dining. The financial strain became obvious, as I could no longer afford to spend money on extra things. Every time Beverly talked about extravagant expenses, I felt a sense of anxiety. Every time we went on vacation to a tropical island, it inevitably led to a quarrel. At the beginning of my financial difficulties, she didn't pay attention, pretending that everything was fine. But as the months turned into a year, her discontent grew louder. She began to find fault with every little thing, starting from how we ate and ending with the fact that we had to save on food, and so on. She seemed to find cause for discontent in every aspect of our lives. Despite my attempts to assure her that everything would be fine when my business flourished, her complaints did not stop. But my attempts to explain the situation and find understanding on Beverly's part were in vain because she remained indifferent to my difficulties. Despite the fact that I considered myself responsible for her well-being, my sacrifices remained unnoticed and unappreciated. Beverly's expectations of returning to her former luxurious lifestyle or even surpassing it were simply unattainable given my financial difficulties. Inevitably, there came a time when I had no choice but to sell my beloved Mercedes S-Class to ease the growing financial burden. This decision, although necessary, seemed to be ignored since Beverly did not recognize the seriousness of the situation and the sacrifices I made. While at the farm, I discovered that Beverly was furious, resulting in a week-long silence between us. To be honest, I was stunned by her reaction as it seemed too inadequate to the current situation. 
It's not like I completely stopped our dates or vacations together. We still went out, but not to the places that attract celebrities. Instead, we chose trendy restaurants designed for ordinary people, and as for our vacations, we had our share of complaints. Every month, we went on exciting trips to neighboring states in search of adventure and pleasure. But despite all our entertainment, Beverly constantly expressed her dissatisfaction, claiming that these trips to the states were not enough and longed for international travel. Gradually, I began to keep silent in the face of her complaints, preferring to focus on the impressions that were meaningful to me. As the year went on, I couldn't help but notice a change in Beverly's behavior towards me. Our once close bond seemed to have faded, and even when we were at home together, there was a strangeness between us that turned us into strangers. She made the decision to spend more time with her friends and attend parties without me, and I understand that my choice to sell the car could have played a role in this. But the situation did not stop there. Beverly began to stay overnight and return early in the morning smelling of alcohol. She responded to my questions about her whereabouts with aggression. Unable to tolerate her unpleasant behavior any longer, I contacted her mother and told her about everything that had happened. According to Beverly's mother, she thinks that Beverly is difficult to understand, but nevertheless, she promised to make an effort. After learning that I had spoken to her mother, Beverly quickly returned home that day filled with anger. In the heat of the moment, I yelled at her in response, but unfortunately, this did not help resolve the situation. Angry, she rushed out of the house and returned only after a two-day absence. All these two days, she deliberately ignored my calls and did not respond to my messages. Oddly enough, during this time, she continued to actively write on Instagram, taking note of her subscribers' comments but ignoring my opinion. After the problem was solved, she continued to express dissatisfaction about finances. In response, I suggested that she think about creating her own online clothing store, which she had already mentioned earlier, and perhaps sell her previously worn clothes if buying celebrity clothes is not possible. I wanted to highlight the fact that she has a significant audience on Instagram and Twitter. However, instead of considering my offer, she got offended and started a new argument. To be honest, I'm already tired of her constant bickering over trifles. I got tired, and I decided to turn to my mother for support to sort out the situation. Despite Beverly's shortcomings, I genuinely cared about her and imagined our future together, so I mostly tolerated her irrational behavior. The day my mother arrived, Beverly was at home, hoping for a mature conversation. I expected that everything would be resolved safely, but to my horror, Beverly started another quarrel, escalating the tension in my presence. I witnessed the shocking moment when she slapped my mom. At that moment, she officially ended our relationship, telling me to get into real life, and left. An outburst of anger and heartache overwhelmed me, prompting me to chase after her, but my mother intervened, not allowing me to do so. I stood speechless when Beverly came into our room, quickly packed her things, and wheeled her suitcase out of the house without even looking at our devastated faces. When she was out of sight, Mom made me make a solemn promise. I swore to myself that I would never associate myself with someone like Beverly again. After she left, I was heartbroken, but my determination to succeed in business would not let me rest. I put so much effort into it that it was simply impossible to leave it. I must admit that for several months after our breakup, I surreptitiously watched Beverly's life. It was at this time that I found out that she had ended our relationship to continue an affair with a man she met at the gym. The irony of fate did not escape me, since I crossed paths with this man at various social events during my difficult period. She met a man who had a strong physique and a significant audience on Instagram. Online, he mostly showed off his muscular torso and attractive appearance, often accompanied by photos of him in shorts. By coincidence, during those difficult months, I found myself at an ordinary agricultural conference, which I did not want to attend at the insistence of my friends. That's where I crossed paths with Jennifer. After the event, we started talking and gradually established friendly relations. Jennifer contrasted sharply with Beverly, demonstrating remarkable intelligence that surpassed the capabilities of the latter. Jennifer became my reliable confidant, on whom I could lean in the most difficult moments. I didn't hesitate to tell her about all my business ideas, difficulties, and personal experiences. To my surprise, Jennifer not only sympathized with me but also promised her unwavering support. 
This is how our indissoluble partnership was born, in which we took up any business hand in hand. Even more impressive was that she ingeniously suggested looking for potential investors and clients for our mushroom enterprise. When it reached its completion, Jennifer's ingenuity surpassed even my and Beverly's joint imagination, as she constantly offered brilliant ideas that exceeded our wildest expectations. Beverly, an expert in social media and marketing, made a great contribution to my achievements. Thanks to her experience, we quickly attracted investors and within a few months reached millionaire status. At the end of the year, I stopped by the mall for groceries and parked my Porsche 911 in the parking lot. As I got out of the car, I noticed Beverly looking at her as if mesmerized by her presence. I went unnoticed until I greeted her, and the surprise on her face was so priceless that I wanted to capture it forever. Stumbling over the words in the first moments, she asked about the car, and I continued to explain what happened after she left. I told Jennifer's story and how she played a key role in the huge success of my business. After hearing all this, she began to apologize for hitting my mother, but I assured her that those events were in the past. She offered to meet for a cup of coffee, but I explained that it would be unfair to Jennifer and abruptly left her. Despite her attempts to communicate, I no longer paid attention to her and left, leaving her in a difficult position. Later, I noticed that she constantly liked and commented on all my Instagram posts and decided to block her. Since then, I have not crossed paths with her. Several times at the club, I was very surprised when I saw her in a waitress uniform, as our mutual friend told me that the pumped-up guy she left me for did not tolerate her expensive purchases and selfish nature for long. He just chased her out of his house. No agency wanted to cooperate with her. She had been looking for a brand that would want to cooperate with her for a long time, but she never managed to work as a model. As a result, she had to get a job as a waitress at a club where she was usually a guest.